Hey friends, today I have a, a special guest, it's Tom. Hello Tom. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. Okay. Uh, it is uh, our uh, next meeting for a podcast, now it's a videocast. And uh, uh, last time I think we met uh, four, four or five months back. Right. And yeah. Yeah. It was it was a few months, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we did a great talk uh, about uh, your experience of teaching to inmates. So guys, uh, please uh, find this um, uh, this link to the podcast and download it, listening to it. Uh, and uh, now we met <coughs> at uh, the seminar by Dorothy Zemmer, yeah? Correct. Uh, so did you enjoy it? Yes, it was a good uh, workshop for me. Um, you know, I, it made me aware of certain things like writing, because I, when I was teaching in the prisons, uh, we we did a lot of topics on writing. So I, I just refreshed my memory a lot, and then the reading parts. Reading was very interesting to me because it's usually you just throw the student in there, let them read, and you know, learn vocabulary, pronunciation. That's it. But the preparation for it was so intensive, and then the peer review and so forth. And you know, and also the um, using your textbooks, using supplemental materials. That was that was something I I do a lot of that, and I, I I was I was pleased with the workshop because I think it it was basically a lot of things that we I'm, I knew already, but a lot of things I need to refresh on because after a while you get so ingrained in your work that you forget the basics. Mm. Yeah, it's a good point. I would, I would definitely agree with you. Uh, with me, I um, I got uh, more confident after this event by Doris Zemmer because uh, her speech uh, reinforced my uh, like what I do on a daily basis because uh, uh, it's uh, it's from her book on academic English. Uh, that I learned how to how to give instructions, how to explain students on uh, on building their writing skills or mastering, advancing their writing skills. So, do you teach writing? I don't teach it right now, but I've had I've had a request recently from a young young fellow. He's twelve years old and wants to do it because he lives in a an American school in Dubai and they did a lot of writing and he found it and he came to Mints. He's not getting that, so he's he. he you know, he knows that I'm American, he knows I've taught writing, so he's interested, so I'll see if that works out. I see. And uh, why do you think there is such a distinction between um, uh, between Dubai and Belarus? Well, it's because of the fact that what they're doing there is it, it was an American high school. This is run by Americans. Okay. So they had complete American, uh, and they, he was in the seventh grade. And I taught seventh grade in the U.S. and I know what the standards are, and I know what he had to go through, and and they and it's more academic than a lot of the schools are in the U.S. And so he got a lot of a lot of good training, and he pretty you know. And I from talking to him, I I get a good I feel that he really knows a, a lot of good things. He just wants to keep it up. He just wants he, his his speaking ability is wonderful. I say wonderful. Nowadays, you see uh, non-native speakers are have, like many of, of them have uh, a very good level. Right. So, yeah. Well, as for me, I believe that we, the Belarusians, especially the young learners, don't have enough of writing because I see their essays on a daily basis because I prepare students for both IELTS, TOEFL, and of course SAT. With SAT being the ultimate challenge for them, yeah. where they need to analyze an article. Uh, so, uh, have you ever passed SAT or like uh, exams like that? Okay, I, I, I took the SATs and I, and I took the uh, MRE, which is. Uh, which is for the master's degree when you, you go and do that. And I actually scored a hundred points better on the MRE than I did SAT. But then the SAT has changed a lot. It, it's, it's changed from when I was taking it. And it's, it's now, um, it's, well, one thing is on, you can take it on the internet. You don't have to do the written part and everything else. But it, SAT, a lot of it's the vocabulary. I mean, you, you oh, yeah. the vocabulary that they use, I mean, it, 
you never use these for the two capillary words, and all of a sudden they're there, and you've got to remember what they are, and and you you try to prepare. I mean, you, you, and you I didn't prepare when I took mine, but uh, I think today they have more preparation for SATs than they have when I was still there. So I think that's that helps the preparation. You, all these exams we're talking about, you can prepare for them, but you also got to make sure the students understand this that what they've learned is not going to be on those exams, but the, the, uh, the uh, what do you call, I can't think of the word right now, but what, what you're doing, like for example, you're, you're doing vocabulary, how, this is how vocabulary is going to be presented, but it's not going to be these words, it's going to be different words, so you need to bone up on all the words and the grammar structures, you know, you don't have to have these sentences, you're going to have different sentences, but it's still the same structure. Right, so you cannot just memorize things. Right. So it's not gonna help you if you sit down and start like you know cramming and uh, memorizing like enigma, enigmatic, like. Yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. And yeah. that's a good that's a good point there. Right. Mm, okay. And uh, do you teach vocabulary? I have I have to teach it because of the fact that I you know I'm teaching the students, but I just basically try to make sure we go over it and to see if they understand. Of course, it should be a follow-up where you use those that vocabulary later because it, you learn vocabulary, just like me with Russian. When I speak in Russian, I learn a word and I know it then, then if it comes up again, I forgot it. You know, and I think that happens a lot with anybody who learn, anybody who's learning a foreign language. Follow-up is so hard to do because you're involved in the next lesson and you just don't think to add something from the previous lesson. So um, that, that's, that's one of the things I think that as far as vocabulary goes, follow-up is so important. Yeah, absolutely. And do, do you give homework? Yeah, I give some homework. I have these little worksheets I give them and so we check it out. And sometimes they, they, don't, they don't know how to do something, which is good because then that tells me what they need to work on. Oh yes, uh, feedback is so necessary right. when you're a teacher, so you need to understand how the students understood the task and uh, like um, the overall grasp of it. Right, because they won't tell you when they don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I believe it's uh, the, um, the general dis uh, difference between people in Belarus or maybe in Eastern Europe in general and people in the US, would you say that? Uh, that I think, well, I was in Poland not long ago, and they spoke English so well, I was surprised. And then I, I saw a, um, a, a chart recently on ESL speakers in a, throughout the world, and the percentage of people who spoke English as a second language. And Poland was number 10 on the list, I could not believe it, like 61%. In countries like Norway and Sweden and, you know, all these countries, Luxembourg, they all had very high percentages, like in the 70s and 80s percent of people speaking. Because I've been to Denmark before and Copenhagen, everybody spoke English like a native. I mean, I, I, I didn't, I don't know if they knew how to spoke, speak Danish, you know, because I didn't hear any Danish. I only heard was, um, you know, English. So um, just, I, I think that a lot of those countries, they, I, I don't know what they do. I, I was, I'd like to find out because in Belarus, it's, it's not the same. I don't know what, why, but um, I want to be here to make a difference. I hope that I can make a difference for some people. Yeah, and of course you are making a difference because from you, uh, in general, um, a student can learn what, uh, what an American is. Right. <laughs> yeah, how he or she looks like. Right. Like how. Uh, how he speaks, like what his uh, general like thinking patterns and stuff. Right. So you're like a model of Amer like a representative of an American here, of, of the whole America. I don't know if I am because I, I'm a little bit different than most Americans because I have my roots, I have Slavic roots. Okay. My father's family was Czech, my mother's family was Belarus, and my grandmother was born in Belarus. <laughs> so and, you're not exactly and, and like my, that American American. And then my other grandfather was born in Ukraine. Both grandfathers were born in Ukraine, but one was Czech, one was, I don't know, maybe Ukrainian, Russian, Polish, Belarusian, who knows? Because in that part of the world, um, you know, the people were moving all the time. And so, because uh, my family moved from 
and Pilsen and in Czech was now Czech Republic to Rovno and then to um, Proštěnic, which is in the Don, uh, Donetsk region, and then they immigrated from through the Chitomir, uh, you know, the, all over the place. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, like we are always seeking better life, yeah. <laughs> better conditions. Right. As for example, uh, this summer I've been to the U.S. and I've seen all those people who were first lived. Uh, like it's it's a kind of a pattern when you um, migrate to the United States. You first come to California. Oh yeah, <laughs> California, New York. And New York, yes. Like, why is this happening? <laughs> and and then then when he's telling you from near Richmond, Virginia, what, what is that? You know, is that does that exist? You know, <laughs> because I know when I see advertisements here, uh, I've seen them in the metro yeah. station. Oh, we teach American English. Yeah. Teachers from New York. Well, you know, it's a big country. New York is not the only place. <laughs> you know, teachers from New York, like, because yeah. they're from New York, they're better? No. Have you heard the New York accent? No. <laughs> you, you guys, you guys need to, you need to stop talking like that, man. Because, you know, you, you, you know, if I go to 33 and 33 and, I, and I talk like that, you know, nobody understand me. <laughs> so, You're making a, a New Yorkian accent, right? Yeah, you know, I, I lived in New York for a while and I, and they don't like southern accents. I have a Virginia accents, and so they always made fun of it. So I tried to, I tried to um, change my accent when I was there. And I was talking to one of my professors. He was from Canada. He was Jewish, and he was, and you know, and I told him about how they didn't like the southern accent and so forth. He says, "Look, I'm a Canadian Jew, lived in New York, teaching at a Catholic university, and you're worried about your accent? Okay." That struck a nerve. He, <laughs> he, he didn't like it. I like. He was one of my best professors. I really liked him. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so there is no such thing as standard English any longer. Yeah, the standard English used to be based on what's called the Nebraska accent uh, and the Midwest type Nebraska, accent. Nebraska, really. Nebraska, the Omaha, Nebraska area is what used to be called standard English, Midwestern type of English. Uh, but you know, basically. Some people would say I speak standard English. I have a little bit of Virginia uh, accent there, but it's mostly. But um, Dorothy, when Dorothy was here, she spoke what we considered a standard American English. Um, so she, you know, and most, you know, if you listen to the television and you listen to the radio and so forth, that's the, what's considered standard English. Except maybe in the South, they're a little bit different sometimes. But, but basically, it's. Um, you know, it, just variations, but um, you really don't, can't define one region to be the standard English, you know, it's just people, as long as you're understood. <laughs> so. uh, as far as I know, uh, standard British was uh, uh, the language adopted from a Southern England, I think, yeah, yeah uh, something like that. Yeah, from Southern England, as, um, and I know um, in the US, um, until about the Revolutionary War, they spoke the same language in the U.S. that they did in England. And then after the war, I think this, they decided to change a few things, like for example, the R sound. Um, they all... Sorry, do, do you mean the... Uh, which war? Uh, uh, the Revolutionary War of the 18th century, yeah. 1776 to 1783. Right? 81 is when the war ended, but 83 was a peace treaty. And they, People in Southern England, the aristocrats, didn't like, I don't know whether it was a reaction to losing the war, but they started, it, it was a little fad that started, but instead of saying hard, they started saying hi. And instead of saying there, they say there. You know, and they stopped saying the R sound. And eventually it caught on and it became a part of the language. But in the US, they still retain, maintain the way it spoke, was spoken. I mean, it was, they, they the, um, today, when they don't use the R sound, that's, that's not always been the British uh, language. It, that's something that was, you know, people, you know, like today, people start, uh, the language changes all the time. People start saying things a certain way, and then all of a sudden, it becomes accepted. Uh, you know, and so that was, that's what happened back in the late 19th, 18th, early 19th century, and that's why we, we say hard, they say hi. We say car, they say ka. 
you know, so <laughs> we just, it's just, it's just one of those things. Yeah, so when you're referring to the war, you mean the uh, 1776 war. Right, exactly. The when we speak, I mean in Belarus, when you speak about the war, we, we mean like the Great Patriotic War, even not the World War II. Yeah, yeah. yeah so there the, the war for the fatherland and mm -hmm. so forth, you know. Yeah. And we call it the Revolutionary War in the United States. Uh, uh, some people call it the war for American independence. Oh yeah, I think uh, that was the time of Lincoln and... Uh, no, Lincoln was in Civil War. It was a Civil War in the 19th century, 1861 to 1865. Oh, I'm this, sorry. This, this, My history skills are so poor. This was a war before the United States became a country. They were, they were still a British colony. Mm. They were fighting against the British to gain independence from Britain because they didn't want to pay a half a cent tax on, t on tea. On tea, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that was the tea party. Yeah, oh yeah. That, and, and when the war started, only one-third of the people supported the war. Two-thirds were still loyal to England. And, and it took a while. And, of course, uh, the, the colonists were losing the war at the beginning until they got a little help from one of, a Belarusian by the name of Pleskusko. And then there was, uh, there was a couple of other people like Polatsky from Poland and that's Baron von Stuben from uh, Prussia. And then... Uh, Lafayette from France and all these Marquis de Rochambeau all from France all these countries started helping because one thing is the uh, England was manipulating the economy in Europe and they just wanted to you know toss England out they wanted to defeat <laughs> exactly. England so yeah. they wanted to help the United States and they, and it worked it worked Ponte Gross all these all these U.S. had a lot of help from foreigners in the Revolutionary War well if you just uh, just consider uh, the population at the time. So uh, I believe there were like uh, Irish settlers, oh, yeah. people from uh, maybe uh, maybe England who were like, sent as uh, like kind of revolutionary elements. You know? right. Well, they they really weren't Irish at this time. They were called Scotch Irish, which I don't know where that terminology comes from. But they they drank a lot of Scotch. Oh, they may have. They, they had made a lot of moonshine. I, I talk, you know, that's like making making you know, like some alone, okay, basically. Is what it, but it, they they had a lot of um, yeah. They Scotch Irish uh, were, were I mean they were country folk. They were they weren't from the cities and so forth. And they they settled in the mountains and you know the valleys, and they they brought their unique language. And in fact, they still have that unique type of language and you go to the mountains of Appalachia and places like that. So they, they still have a lot of uniqueness. But it's so great to know that uh, this land, uh, Belarus, or many Poles consider Pastushka is their solely national right. hero. Yeah, in America, everybody, everybody that's Belarusian is considered Polish. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, at some reason, uh, Kaczkusko, uh, uh, Mieskiewicz, uh, you know, he's considered Polish. Uh, I'm trying to think of some other people that they have, but uh, the, the Bielski, uh, Bielski Brigade during World War II is, is presented to the Americans as being a Polish insurrection. For an American, you, you know uh, Belarusian history perfectly. Well, I mean, I have relatives here, so I, I've learned it. And also, I've taught history. I mean, I, I studied history, so, uh, uh, and, you know, it's, it's I, I know I've been to the museums, I've, I've done a little study and so forth in it. Because you need to, when you live in a country, you need to know the history. And, and I still don't know a lot. I still have a lot to learn. But you, you have to learn some of the basics. I mean, Maybe you could uh, give a hint to those who want to prepare for their uh, SAT histories or like subject tests, or at least, at least which, um, I don't know, Days or which important events in U.S. history they should have at, at least some knowledge of. Exactly. Yeah, to pass uh, like SAT or some other test, like mm -hmm. to have like you know general survival skills. Yeah, I mean like July Fourth, seventeen seventy six, the American Civil War period. The, uh, you know a lot of important dates. So sixteen oh seven when the English first arrived uh, or had the first sub permanent settlement. They were. 
they arrived before then, but they, this is the first permanent settlement. And then, of course, the pilgrims and, and so forth. It's, I mean, so you have some important times and important events that happen in U.S. history. But, uh, you know, uh, I taught my, some U.S. history, and I also taught world history when I was in U.S. So I've been all over. <laughs> <laughs> I see. And uh, if you name like top 10 most important people for the U.S. history, what would they be? Oh, that's hard to say because, I mean, I think Franklin D. Roosevelt is one because when he got this through the Depression and through World War II, the, um, John F. Kennedy was one because of the, the emotion it, it caused of him being assassinated. Uh, Martin Luther King is another because of what he did for the Civil Rights Movement. Um, you know, Abraham Lincoln, because of what he did, keeping the, the U.S. together and, and also issuing the Emancipation Proclamation, freeing slaves. And then you have, um, of course, George Washington, who's a founder, Thomas Jefferson, who wrote the Declaration, you know, the Founding Fathers, as they call it, um, James Madison. Um, you also had um, some other people like uh, Daniel Boone, who was a frontiersman that you know, who explored all over. And you had some other people uh, like Grover Cleveland, the only president that was elected to two non-consecutive terms. Um, you know, and this, you can, this can go on and on. Uh, but those are some of the, probably some of the more important ones, you know, so. And of course, President Obama was one that did something that no one ever thought would happen in America. Became the first African-American and actually, uh, he became first African American to become president of the United States. Nobody in, in my lifetime that th would think that that would happen in our lifetime. We still haven't had a woman president. We thought we would have one in 2016, but it didn't work out. So, <laughs> you know. Right. Uh, it's uh, it's funny you mentioned uh, a woman. Finally, like I think, uh, had she become a president. You would have mentioned her in this in the stand list, yeah. Yeah, yeah. oh yeah. But I mean, um, but she, I mean, she is a pretty strong woman, and uh, you know, she, she as, as Secretary of State, she did a lot of great things. Although everybody, uh, well, I would say everybody, then some of the people on the Oversight Committee and the Hives tried to say she was responsible for the deaths of four Americans at the Benghazi consulate and. Uh, and Libya, uh, and they've never been able to prove anything. They spent two and a half years investigating her and never came up with anything to indict her. Wasted a lot of taxpayer money doing that. And they, it's just the, the nature of politics in America right now. It's just, just in a terrible situation. Just terrible right now. So, but that's life. Ah, uh, yeah, sure. Um, We've been uh, discussing uh, different different ways of speech and different accents, and uh, uh, here I have a board, and I think it would be great for uh, both our students, I mean for your students and my students to learn more about uh, different uh, places in in the south, because I'm sure you have this uh, genuine knowledge of right. which I which I don't have. Yeah, so maybe we could draw like the United States and the South. Let's see what color we want to use here. Okay. Alright, the state of Virginia, it's kind of strange. It looks like this. It's on the East Coast and it has a little section that comes off right here called. Mm -hmm. And then you go down this so this is Virginia. Have a state come out like come like this, North Carolina, state comes like this, South Carolina, and then you have the state of Kentucky. Where you get uh, all this fried chicken from? Oh yeah, K KFC, yeah. Yeah. And then you have a part here called West Virginia, which used to be a part of Virginia, 
but then broke away during the Civil War. Um, then you got the state here, Tennessee. Then you have the state of Georgia. Then you have Florida. State of Mississippi. Alabama. Well, actually, actually, I need to go a little bit further over because there's Arkansas stuff in here. Arkansas. So still, <coughs> sorry, uh, still it's all the South, right? Right, and then Louisiana. Oh my God, it's Texas, huge. Texas, 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 and so forth. So it's, you know, this is a, like the southern region, and there's a lot of dialects in this area. Like, for example, in my area of Virginia, and you go to the southern part, you go to North Carolina, a lot of times what you have, you have what's called southern drawl, where you have elongation of vowel sounds, like I is pronounced like ah, and O is pronounced, sometimes pronounced like ah. If you say time, you say time. It's, it's time, it's time to eat breakfast, you hear ya? Okay, and some other, there are a lot of phrases in Southern English, like, you hear ya? Uh, bless your heart, bless your heart. Is it English? This is English. Oh my God. So bless your heart, bless your heart. This is when somebody does something that, you know, is, you know let's say they, they just pass their SAT, and you say, oh, bless your heart. You know, that's like, you know, uh, and then they say, I'm fixing, I'm fixing to go to the stove. Uh, and so a lot of times they, they leave off sounds. Now you go to the, the mountainous area of Virginia, and you have what's called Appalachia. And this is, this was influenced by, right, this area right here. Okay. Yeah. And it goes into North Carolina. Right. And this area was influenced heavily by the Scotch-Irish. Right. And they have a different kind of speech. They say, for example, uh, you see that bird over there, young? And you say, what? Did you see that bird over there, young? They kind of like swallow. Uh, but what, that's what I said was, did you see that bird over there? <laughs> but they have to do, throw in the word, yana, 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 over yana, over yana is that, is a, is a bar. Okay, and you go to Tennessee, they have come a nasalization. They say, Tennessee, Tennessee. I, I, I shot a bar in, in the woods yesterday, and, you know, it's still alive. I don't know why he's still alive. Uh, and then, of course, you've heard Alabama and Mississippi. Uh, if you watch the movie Forrest Gump, that's what, um, what uh, Tom Hanks' uh, his accent he's using in there is an Alabama type of accent. Accent, not accent, but accent. And then a Georgia, this area, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, basically they're from the old English. They spoke English like the British. And so when they, when they speak, they speak somewhat like the same kind of language that the aristocrats of England would speak. But they, when they speak, they just have a little bit of a southernism to it. Uh, like, for example, mother, father, uh, went there and everywhere, and then they would say, mother and father went there and everywhere. You know, that's the only difference, but, they, they, but they'll still use the type of language. If you've ever seen the movie Gone with the Wind, produced in 1935, there's a lot of good Georgia accent, and you can see how, how it's, you know, like uh, Scarlett O'Hara, red, red honey, red honey. And this is another thing you have to realize, by southern speech, they use a lot of words like honey, sweetie, sugar. Hey, thank you, sugar. <laughs> Come back to here, see me again, you hear? And so people throughout the South, you got different dialects, you got different um, expressions, but basically one word will stand out in all the southern dialect, and that is y'all. That stands for you all. Because uh, in the English language, you don't have uh, a, familiar form of you and a, you know, a, what do you call it, a formal, you have just plain you. You say you as one person, you can say you to a whole crowd, 
And people get confused, so they say yao, you all. So they say yao. When I was younger, they said you all. But now they just kind of like morphed into yao. And then you go north, you got things like yous guys, yus, yins, and so forth. So I mean, this way of trying to uh, express the English language with that, because we used to have the word thou for the, that, that lasted until like, like the 17th century, and then it started fading out. And then, and in fact, into the 18th century, even during the time of Benjamin Franklin, he was using the word thou. And then after, uh, after the Revolutionary War, it kind of like faded out and you don't hear it anymore. So, uh, but you know, thou was a way of saying thick, uh, you know, instead of saying, but we don't say that anymore. You say you or you. Okay. <laughs> like cut and dry, black and white. Yeah, just you or you. I mean, and you don't, you're not going to make a mistake if you say you, because you, whether you're talking to it, you know, you don't, like, for example, if I'm talking to, if I'm talking to a woman for the first time and say thick, oh my gosh, I'm like, you know, I, I, I've got to be careful when I'm speaking to someone for the first time, when I say we, when I'm teaching 12 year olds, do I say we or do I say we? You know, so I, it, it's, yeah. I, don't, I don't have to worry about that with English. I say you, that's it. Well, with English, you have to worry about the level of formality anyways, mm -hmm. because you, know, uh, you address like all these text messages nowadays, mm -hmm. like dear madam, dear sir, when oh, you're yeah. applying for a job or how to behave during an interview, for example. Um, I wonder if you had this experience of, you know, formal interviews. Yeah, oh yeah, I've had those um, uh, when I applied to the prison. I mean, I, I had a panel. I mean, it was not just one person, it's like four or five people. And so they all asked you different questions. And so, um, you, know, it, it, you know, they ask questions that, you know, each one has a different set of questions. and. And if you, uh, you try to be prepared, but sometimes they'll ask a question, like for example, when I applied for the prison, they said, are you scared? <laughs> I, I never thought about that. I mean, yeah. I'm working in a prison, are you scared? And you had to think about that one because, you know, I, what do you say to something like that? You said, well, I don't know, I haven't worked there, so I don't know, but they said, well, I'm not scared to start, but I, when I get there, what it's going to be like, and I never, I never really experienced any fear while I was teaching in the prison. I, I just treated them like students, and that's that works. Mm, yeah, I believe that this uh, you know unlabeling works when instead of saying like you know, I get a student and he's a programmer, right? Yeah. So instead of referring to him like every time remembering that he's a, he works in IT, instead. Uh, well, maybe it's a good idea to remember that he's just a student, no matter where he works. Well, uh, I'm of course going to find better context to teach him better, uh, but I'm not going to see him as like, oh, he's in, in IT, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah and that, I think that's, and that, I think that's what we need to work on some here is the fact that. You know, because you teach IT students, I mean, you have to teach IT language because in fact they know that. They yeah. need to know how to speak to people when they yeah. deal with clients, you know. I had a student one time, she had, she got talked to a, a, one of her clients in the U.S. and answered the phone and the woman said, say. And the girl was kind of puzzled, what do I say, what do I say? Well, say is a way of saying hello or hi. I mean, but if you're not from the U.S., you're not going to know that. So, exactly. so the girl was confused, and and that's the kind of stuff that you need to know when you're speaking to client because not all of them are going to be formal. You know, some of them will speak more informally, exactly. and so and you know, use a colloquial, and so you need to, and that's what I try to work on a little bit with some of my students. I have an American conversation class where I try, you know, try to get students just to speak, just to speak, and just try to just try to get them to understand how to speak and so forth. So, and, um, but that, it's, yeah, speaking, conversation is very important, very oh, yeah. important. Yeah, because it's, uh, it's the way we interact yeah. in conversations. Uh, let me ask you more about lately. If you were born, for example, in Georgia or in South Carolina, is it like a label that 
that you carry till the end of your life? Well, it could be. I mean, uh, I hope not. Because there's competition in Virginia and North Carolina. Okay? Oh. <laughs> we think uh, in Virginia there was always a thing that people from North Carolina are, are country bumpkins. They, they're from the country and they, they ain't very smart. I mean, we, we had that impression, of course, the, the, and in fact, the thing is we have our barbecue, our pork barbecue, and Virginia puts tomato sauce in there and North Carolina puts vinegar in theirs. So, that you, so if you order barbecue, you have to say North Carolina or Virginia. Um, and of course, North Carolinians think that Virginians think that they're elitists and so forth. And so there's that, you know, it's not so, so prevalent now. Yeah. I mean, it was, that was back when I was younger. I mean, sure. things have changed. But in those days, it was always this thing. You, you thought the North Carolinians were the back country, they, you know, there, and so forth. But, and they, we thought they didn't know how to talk, you know, because of that southern accent I had. And so they, we, but you know, things have changed. It, it, it's become more diversified in the United States. And uh, you know, people, you don't see so much of the, you hear Southern accents, uh, but you know, you may, some people may make fun of it and all that stuff, but it's not as prevalent as it used to be. Mm. Uh, so you're not gonna be discriminated on the basis of your accent? No. 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 Once, you know, I, oh, I should take that back because if you have a Hispanic accent um, in some areas, uh, I mean, people if people hear you speaking with a uh, Hispanic or Latino accent, people go go off. They 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 get they go crazy because they want you to go back to your country. There's a lot of, a lot of that going on now in the U.S. Uh, That's terrible. I mean, it, it, yeah, it's it's awful. It's uh, and of course. Uh, you know, they, it's, it's mind-boggling to me. We'll find out on Tuesday what's going to happen because we have our big elections and if the Democrats win, we may get our country back, we may not. I don't know. Sorry, I'm not at all into politics. Yeah. Like, after living in Belarus and seeing no changes, I completely lost interest. Well, well one thing is, People don't get involved in politics in the United States, but it's, it's no longer a question of involving yourself in politics. It's, it's a question of involving yourself in humanity because we're talking about losing a country. We're talking about going to fascism. I mean, that's how, and, and you can say, well, that can't happen in the United States. Oh, I, I love my country. It's, you know, you, if you don't like it, leave or something. But it's not the same. It's, it's, I've lived there my whole life. And I, you know, we've experienced where we had changes and so forth, but you come back to it. Well, we're not coming back to it. Right now, if we retain the Republican, the Republicans do nothing to stop Trump, nothing. When Obama was president, they really did everything they could to stop Obama. But for Trump, they do nothing. And, you know, Obama's, I mean, Trump is getting away with everything. That is no longer p politics. It now has become the fact of, does this country survive? I mean, it, people don't want to talk about politics, but in some cases, and like this case, politics, you can call it politics, but it's more survival. I mean, it, it's, um, I mean, I wasn't, I'm, of course, being a history teacher and all, I was involved in political situations and so forth, but I think we're coming to the point now where people who never involved themselves in politics are coming involved because it, it, there's so much conflict there's so much there's no meeting between the people anymore that it's grown apart it's kind of like the period before the Civil War in America now we have you have the north and the south but now you got the right and the left the, the right wing and the left wing of the, of the American people and they don't meet they don't meet and they call each other names and they call, they demean every each other it's it's totally bizarre I mean, uh, to me. And so th that's why, um, I mean, people I've, I've known all my life were never political. All of a sudden they're political on the wrong side, <laughs> but they, they're, they're political. And, uh, and I just wondered, I mean, it's just, in Belarus, you're not gonna see that. But, but in US, you wouldn't have seen it 
two, three years ago. But after the election of 2016, things have completely changed. So uh, it's, a, it's a great divide which is, uh, which is there in every maybe neighborhood, in every, uh, I don't know, every right. city. But can you, for example, draw a map of uh, like support of Republicans and Democrats? Is there a map or it is, uh, it is not about geographic? Okay, if you look at this map, mm -hmm. all these areas except for Virginia mm -hmm. are Republican. Republican. This is all this, all the South is Republican. The Midwest is Republican. Very few Democratic areas like Virginia, um, state of Washington, D.C. Uh, you go along the East Coast, you've got New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, uh, New York, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts. Those are Democratic. And then California, Oregon, Washington. And basically that's it. Maybe New Mexico. And sometimes Colorado. Uh, New Mexico is a bit there. New, New Mexico is over here. Oh, so, okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah like to, on, the, uh, on the left right. of Texas, right? Yeah, and so... Yeah. But, and that, that's about it. There were, there are much more that there's thirty some states that are Republican, and but there's, there's maybe like fifteen, sixteen Democrat. That's about it. But two of the Democratic states, like New York and California, have very large population. Texas has a very large population, but it's a Republican state, and so um, most of the US Southerners are, are Republican. Mostly Midwesterners, uh, they used to be Democrat, but because the unions no longer exist properly, um, and because they have their jobs being shipped overseas, uh, they don't have they don't have any work. They they're suffering, and they blame it on the Democrats, so they go Republican, and that's what happened in the election. I mean, we had states like Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, which are industrial states. Where the workers have always been, have always been Democratic. They went Republican, and those three states won won the election. Only got a total of eighty thousand votes between the three states. They won the election for Trump. Uh, probably all these production states are now Hong Kong. What else? Uh, Brazil. Singapore, <laughs> Brazil, Malaysia, Indonesia, China, uh, Kuwait. Uh, I mean, uh, you look at. Labels on your clothes, but you're never gonna find made in USA. It made. I don't know. Are you suffering from it that that there's no like there's no label you say? Well, I think uh, there is a there's a it's it's a good thing because Americans uh, work uh, more in service sector. They need to, uh, they don't need to uh, to work like you know nine to five uh, like uh, at a factory floor. Right. But they can they can do office jobs, administrative jobs. So what's wrong with that? Yeah, well, I, I used to work in I've worked in a couple of factories in my life. Uh, I worked in a, a sports coat factory where we made sports coats uh, for uh, different companies and so forth. And and the, the, it was a difference in quality too because it, it depends on who we're making it for, what kind of quality we put into it. Uh, I'm not going to explain all that, but there's certain things we would do. And I worked in the tobacco factory because tobacco was king in Virginia one time, and everybody they had plenty of jobs. And it was a, it wasn't good for my health, but I, you know, they paid well, and so you know you just so I worked in a couple of factories. But now we don't have we don't have that anymore. We do have some factories, but they are not like they used to be, you know. Like, uh, uh, so you know the fact in those days we had. I also walked, worked in a suitcase factory. I forgot about that one. Oh. Yeah, so I mean, just but those were kind of jobs in those days. But not, and they were some of them were decent and some of them weren't. Depends on what, how strong the union was. But today, for example, you live in one of those states. Uh, you wanna earn something between fifty to one hundred thousand per year. So what do you do? Well, it's gonna be hard. <laughs> You have to get usually if you get into an administrative position, um, you know, managerial. That might be the only way. If you are uh, now, for example, in Virginia, when you've been teaching for about twenty years, you might be able to reach the fifty thousand dollar range. But if you're going up, um, but a lot of times the IT, the that that's where you make your money. 
I mean, th those are the jobs in these, these states where you make the money. But then, you know, some of the computer programming that they used to have, they've got so many of them now that the, the, the salary range is going down because of the fact that they, they you know, but the IT people are making good money. Yeah. And you, you know, and there's like the, um, North Carolina, Ra Raleigh, they have the, they have the triangle there where they have all these businesses, startups, and they do a lot of uh, IT and everything else. And that's a good, they have, in Charlotte, North Carolina, you have areas where the, very strong economics. So you have certain pockets where people can make good money. But most of the time, depending on where you live and depend, you know, the region you live in, if you live in a country, you're not going to make much money. <laughs> uh, one thing I learned in the United States this, uh, this summer, mm -hmm. uh, I was staying uh, here in Florida, and it was uh, not exactly Miami, uh, it was uh, Boca Raton. Uh, yeah, Boca Raton, like, yeah. Like a luxurious place. Right. Yeah, I was lucky. <laughs> and uh, the zip code was double uh, three, four eight seven, and uh, everybody seemed to seemed to know this mm -hmm. uh, the zip code and I learned that um, location is everything like the same type of house in this zip code may cost a million dollars and uh, for example one mile to the south it's gonna cost like one hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars so is it true for all the oh, locations yeah. De definitely because definitely. Mm -hmm. I live in an area well, I live in a little section of town where the homes are like over 50 years old and the range is from like, like 80,000 to 100,000. But then you go across the street and they got these brand new homes and those are ranged from a half a million to a million. And, oh. and, and, and we're right across the street from each other. So, I mean, and because of that, that particular region and then you go to other counties and they, they have all these disparate type of uh, income, I mean, uh, levels of uh, housing, and some of them are way up there. Some of them depends on the region. Um, we have, um, we have uh, in Henrico County and in Chesterfield County, you have some very wealthy people, very wealthy, and they have homes well over a million. It's just, it's amazing. <laughs> and I look, my home's like about 93,000. <laughs> so it's cheap. It, does, it sounds expensive here, but it's cheap in America. I never knew such, how such prices existed. Yeah, well, that's because uh, it needs a lot of work. <laughs> so, you know, until, until you get up to a certain standard, you, you're gonna rate your home being more, you know, so. Uh, one thing I think uh, we could uh, uh, we could also suggest our students is uh, uh, what are the spots that you advise they visit? Maybe they are um, I don't know uh, they are valuable as tourist destinations or they are absolutely unique or super cheap. So is there anything you super would like cheap to is hard to say. <laughs> okay, in my own state. There's a lot to see. Virginia is a state that has a lot of history, a lot of uh, natural, uh, and so forth. Uh, you go on the east coast over here, and you got the Atlantic Ocean. You got a lot of beaches. You got yeah, yeah. Virginia Beach and Sandbridge and others. Then you go here in this area. You got Williamsburg and Jamestown, where America was founded and where the first capital of Virginia was, and so forth. Then you got Richmond. It's which was the capital of the Confederacy during the Civil War. Mm -hmm. um, then you've got, in this area, you've got the Shenandoah Valley, which is very famous for its beauty and its mountains and so forth. You also have a lot of caverns, a lot of caverns there that are very... Um, and then, of course, you've got Washington, D.C., and you got that area. And you go into um, other places, like we've got Charleston in South Carolina, uh, you've got um, Georgia, you've got Atlanta, Atlanta, uh, you got Savannah on the coast, Florida, of course, you, you know Miami, Boca Raton, you got Tallahassee over here, and you know, Kentucky, you got Louisville, you got, you got the Kentucky Derby horse races that go on there, 
And, you know, uh, we've got a lot of things going on. Louisiana, got New Orleans, which is a really famous place. Uh, and, you know, you got the, and you've got a lot of places you could go to in, in the south. Of course, you also could go up north, you go to Niagara Falls, you go to New York City. Uh, you, of course, you can go to the Grand Canyon out in the west. Um, you can go up to um, the Willamette Valley in Oregon and, and Washington State. And you've got Chicago, which is my favorite kind of town. Okay, Chicago is just loaded with so much diversity. Uh, and it's just a wonderful, I mean, you, there's a lot you can do in the United States. It's, if you want to explore the United States and, and a lot of famous places, you, you've got a couple of years, I mean, because you're not going <laughs> to do it right away. I mean, I, I have, there's a lot of places I haven't been to the United States, and I've lived there all my life, and so it's just, it's just a lot there. It's a lot there. So it's, if you want, and it, there's a lot of beauty. I mean, the state of Virginia is a beautiful state, especially when you go to the western part where the mountains and the valleys, I mean, it's just like, it just takes your breath away sometimes. So I, I enjoy when I'm going to the western part of the state. You can see the stars at night going up, standing on top of a mountain. It's so, so beautiful. Uh, Tom, I would like to thank you so much mm -hmm. for, uh, to, for doing all these uh, wonderful explanations. I feel like I've uh, again visited, uh, visited the South and uh, I learned something, not much, but something mm -hmm. about the South and Rome. So, oh, yes, yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> gotcha, gotcha, man. And, uh, I hope we'll uh, continue our meetings and make uh, valuable, uh, useful videos and audios for our students. Okay, that's good. All right, thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.